scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John. It's the resurrection story. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not laying with the other linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where have you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Will you join your hearts in prayer with mine? Living God, by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the light of this new day. Open our lips to tell of the empty tomb. Open our hearts to receive your good, good news. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name and in whose embrace we pray. Amen. In the Gospel of John, the Easter story begins with these words. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Here in church, the Easter story begins with the congregation singing with bells ringing, with the bright light streaming, with trumpet sounds, with voices rising, with alleluias filling the air. But for Mary Magdalene, Easter Sunday begins in darkness. When Jesus died on the cross, the gospel says, a cloud covered the sun and it became like night in the middle of the day. The sun 
did not shine. And for Mary, as she trudged to the tomb with heavy feet and head bowed in the shadow of grief, it didn't seem like Easter at all. For her, it was still Good Friday. The unfolding drama before Easter must have been a blur to her. When it started, it had all looked so promising, so full of hope. Jesus riding into Jerusalem, palm branches waving, crowds singing. But the parade quickly fell away. And before the week was over, you know the story, Judas had betrayed him and Peter had denied him. Jesus had been arrested, taken, and tried. That supper they shared, it was his last. That prayer in the garden, it made him sweat. Great drops like blood. That crowd, the one proclaiming Hosanna with such good cheer had turned on him caught up in the bloodlust and the fear and the political power struggle, they shouted, crucify, instead. And that's what happened. Those soldiers, they gripped him by the arm, they crowned his head with thorns, they nailed him to a cross, they pierced him inside. And those disciples he loved, helpless and afraid for their own lives, they abandoned him. And now, he was buried in a tomb. Mary Magdalene was a witness to all of it. The hope waving high in the air and the faith falling away in a flash. The goodness of the intentions and the wickedness of the actions. The Gospel says that Mary Magdalene was there at the cross. She was there on Good Friday. So when John wrote the words, while it was still dark, he must have understood how dark it was, how dark it felt to Mary Magdalene and to the others still living in a Good Friday world. We know what it's like to live in a Good Friday world. Just look at a few things that have happened in our world this past Holy Week. Headlines from newspapers. The mother of all bombs was dropped in Afghanistan. An Airbnb host left a guest stranded because of her race. The Department of Homeland Security moved to increase capacity for deporting undocumented immigrants. Staggering evidence of war crimes in Syria present no clear path to justice for perpetrators. A teenager was arrested as a suspect for the bomb threats to the Jewish community center in Boulder. A few days ago, a friend of mine wrote to say that while she rejoices in Easter, it is Good Friday that made her a Christian. A God who subjected God's own self to suffering and scorn and being abandoned by broken people so that broken people never need endure alone, in this I can believe. A God who does not flinch in the face of violence and cruelty. A God who knows darkness and has experienced dying and death. And yet, even while it is still dark, Mary Magdalene decides to make her way to the tomb. John does not tell us why she goes. Perhaps she just needs to see it again, the finality of it, the heavy stone, the closed tomb. Perhaps she is in search of that sense of closure people talk about so that she will know it is over so that she can return to her old life. Perhaps the air of grief in her own house is so heavy she just needs to breathe. So she goes out into the early morning 
into the damp air, into the dark. But when she gets there, she finds something completely unexpected. The rock is rolled away. And that, just that, nothing more, undoes her, and she runs away. Mary runs to the room where the men have locked themselves in. And that sends Peter and another disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, the text says, which could have been any one of them. It sends them running, and they run to the tomb. And when they get there, they bend low. They lean in. They look through the doorway. They see that he is gone. She was right about that. And that only his grave clothes remain and that they are rolled up on the ledge. One of them believes, the gospel says, but whatever it is that he believes in, it doesn't say. They are at a loss and it makes no sense and it is still early and still so dark and it still feels like Good Friday. And not knowing what else to do, they go back to the room where the others are hiding and they lock themselves in. The rest of the story belongs to Mary. It is evident she believes Jesus' body has been stolen. And for that, she weeps. Had it not been enough that he had been humiliated, that they killed him, that they had won, now it seems they have desecrated his grave and even his body is gone. Her grief grows deeper and when two strangers ask about her tears, she cries, they have taken my Lord away and I do not know where they have put him. She is so distraught, she doesn't even notice that she has just spoken to angels. And then, when Jesus appears to her, she thinks she has just talked with the gardener. Perhaps it is too dark to see him. Perhaps her tears blur her vision. Perhaps she is already used to living in a Good Friday world. And when that's the place you live all the time, you don't see angels, you only see enemies. You don't find comfort, you only see threat. When you live only in a Good Friday world and your vision has become dimmed by disappointment and despair, by suspicion and cynicism, it is easy to assume that the body has been taken away, the promise pilfered, the hope stolen. Everyone you meet looks like a potential thief rather than a familiar friend, which is perhaps why Mary does not recognize who is standing right in front of her when he asks her who she is looking for. But even though she cannot see him, Jesus stays right beside her. And then he says her name, Mary. And in that moment, by that one tender word, by that simple, single, loving gesture, everything changes. Everything. The whole plot shifts. The entire story turns. The darkness of Good Friday fades and the dawn of Easter rises. The author, Frederick Beekner points out that when the writers of all four Gospels come to the most important part of the story they have to tell, they say it in whispers. When they speak of the resurrection, of the Jesus who isn't dead anymore, of the one who is risen and is here, they do it quietly. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. It is the most amazing thing that ever happened. 
the greatest plot twist of all time, but the earliest announcements of it are subdued. There was no choir of angels in the sky to proclaim it. There was no sudden explosion of light in the sky. After all the drama of Holy Week and the violence of Good Friday, Easter rises with the most tender details. A stone that's been slipped to the side. The bending, the leaning, the looking in, the folded clothes, the gentle questions, the spoken name. For Thomas, he will recognize him when Jesus shows him his wounds. For Peter, it will be the question on the beach, do you love me? Asked three times to cover each denial. For the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they will find his presence again in the breaking of bread. Buechner says, the way the Gospels tell it, Jesus came back from death not in a blaze of glory, but more like a candle flame in the dark, first in one place and then in another, and then in no particular place at all. You'd think they'd want to describe the resurrection in grander terms. It seems, however, that the gospel writers are not really trying to describe the experience as convincingly as they can, but as truthfully as they can. So they tell it softly, like sharing a surprise, as if honoring a secret in the hush of a dawn's early light, as if planting the seeds in a garden of new creation. It was, after all, a precious thing that happened to those first followers of Jesus, tender and powerful at the same time, unbelievable, and yet in some way true, so true that when Mary runs to tell the disciples, I have seen him risen, they take one look at how she has been changed and they see it must be so. We take one look at her and see how sometimes God does some of God's best work while it is still dark. We remember how every time Jesus came back to his friends, they became more confident, more loving, more daring. We listen to Mary's story, her grief, her fear, her love, and in the end, her witness, I have seen the Lord. And we see that she blooms and we watch Easter rise. Of course, down through the centuries, the church has come to shout rather than to whisper the Easter story, which is not wrong either. Because over time, we have come to see how this miracle, which must have seemed so fragile at first light, has grown to inspire so many and how it speaks to us still. Even after all these years, its hope has not faded. And so we gather here on this day because we have witnessed this miracle of miracles in the resilience of love or in a growing faith in our own lives. Or we gather here because our hearts long to see Easter rising, or because the story is as incomprehensible now as it was then, but we know that this is the way of God's love for us. And the story, it's so beautiful, we just need to hear it again. Today in churches all around the world, Easter is rising with fanfares and fortissimos, with brass and bells and with a bank of lilies on the chancel, signs of God's new creation. And we ourselves will sing a thousand alleluias before the morning is over because in a mad and murderous world full of Good Fridays, we celebrate the truth 
that there is a light that outshines the darkest night. There is a God who knows each one of us by name. There is a new creation growing in the garden right now. There is a love that will win every time, and there is an Easter day that will always rise. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen.